For those of you whom I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name's Karam Beaton Wells and I'm the Dean Internal here at the Melbourne Business School. Let me also warmly welcome all of the, you who have joined us online. And let me acknowledge that those of us here on the Carlton campus grounds of the school are gathering on the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation. We very much recognize and celebrate their connection to country, celebrate their culture, and pay our deepest respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also pay my personal respects to any of our First Nations people who may be joining us in the room this morning. I am working alongside here in hosting this event with our Dean, Professor Ian Harper, and you are going to be hearing more from Ian shortly. This is one of our favorite events, in part because it gets us up at an unusual time in the day, but um, more so because it brings us together, friends, colleagues, and connections of the school. It's a very popular series, um, and as you can see, despite the early morning, uh, there's testament to that in the room as well as online. This morning, we have the great pleasure uh, of hearing from someone who may need little introduction to many of you, Professor Fred Hilmer Ao. And may I also uh, warmly welcome you, Claire. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Fred is one of those unusual species who straddles both the corporate business and academic worlds. Fred was the Vice Chancellor and the President of the University of New South Wales for some years, and prior to that, the CEO of Fairfax. Fred was recognised for his service to management education, competition policy and workplace reform when he was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in 1998. Fred has been on many boards. He's been a director of household names like TNT, Coca-Cola, Amatil, Macquarie Bank. He was chair of Pacific Power and deputy chair of Fosters and Westfield. And Fred, in his spare time, is a prolific author. Fred, is this number five or number six? It's number six. Okay. Well, you are, of course, hearing just about the latest of Fred's other Texts as either author or co-author include When the Luck Runs Out, New Games, New Rules, Strictly Boardroom, Working Relations and Management Redeemed, and most recently, The Fairfax Experience, What the Management Texts Didn't Teach You. And so now, let me welcome Fred and Ian to the stage for a stimulating conversation about just what is wrong with boards. Thanks, Fred. Up on me. Oh, Johnny. Well, good morning from me. Thank you, Karan, for that wonderful introduction. Fred, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Melbourne Business School. You and Claire, have you here this morning? I don't know whether you remember, Fred, but there's a connection between you and me that relates to this place. You offered me a job at AGSN 30 years ago. And there wasn't much that could get the dean of the business school to come across to the faculty and try and make a counter offer, but that did. <laughs> <laughs> so John Rose offered me a job here at the school because of you. So wonderful to have you back here. I didn't, I didn't know that story. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Fred, um, as Karan has just recited, that you've had an extraordinary uh, career, as he, she says, across the public and private sectors. And in particular, they're wouldn't be much about boards that you haven't experienced or thought about, much of which you've taken the time to write down here. But I'd just like to start our conversation this morning, Fred, with a very general question. Why did you write this book now? The sort of issues that you raise here have been around for a while. Public companies have been in and out of the news, so to speak. So what is it that makes this a timely topic in your view? Well, so thanks for that question, and from me, a welcome and good morning, and particularly thank you to your team who've done an outstanding job in getting us here and getting uh, a very strong involvement in the talk. Yeah, thank you, Fred. So why now? Hmm. I last uh, wrote 
about boards 30 years ago in a book that had a great title, Strictly Boardroom. Mm. Um, and with, with what's been going on in the last year or so, particularly Royal Commission, uh, some of the other inquiries or regulatory reviews, uh, there's a sense that not all is well with governance. Uh, the other thing that's happened is there's been an explosion in the issues that boards are dealing with. But, um, it wasn't just talk about performance and compliance and mainly compliance. It's now what are we doing about values? What are we doing about diversity? What are we doing about the environment? And what are we doing about a general involvement as a citizen in a, in a community? And the board is getting those things thrown at it and it isn't clear how the best way to handle it is. So uh, I thought and I was encouraged because of what I'd done 30 years ago to get Strictly Boardroom and bring it up to date. Mm -hmm. But that really wasn't possible because while you know, I agree the issues have been around, yeah. I think that they're coming at boards harder and faster mm. now mm. than they did mm. when when that was written. When Strictly Boardroom was written. Yeah. The other strictly at the time of Strictly Boardroom, uh, we also had a very influential committee, the Cadbury Committee oh, yes. in the UK. Mm. And they they laid out what were really the parameters of good governance as as was seen then in the UK. Mm. And that is still the prevailing approach, the Cadbury approach. And I, I could run into it, but I might turn this back to you, Ian. Otherwise yeah. I'll... Okay. Well, no, thanks, Fred. That's a, that's a great overview. Uh, and obviously over that length of time, lots of things change. But let, let's go to the core of this uh, question about what the public company is actually for and what the board is seeking to do. Because one of the things, as you point out, that has evolved is the range of things that the public company is expected to do and that the board is therefore accountable for. So let's let's tackle this shareholder versus stakeholder thing. I mean, you, you, you say in the book that one of the things that had led you to write about it was your concern about the performance of the public company. And, and that really begs this very question. If you think about the public company as serving the interests of the shareholders only, then you're going to measure performance in one way. If you think about it as answerable to or responsible to a broader group of stakeholders, you're going to think about performance in a different way. And even though the shareholders might not be happy from time to time, you're going to say, yes, but the company is doing its job when you look at it through this wider lens. So let me bowl this one up to you, Fred, right from the outset. What do you think the public company is there to do? Is it to serve its shareholders or a wider group? And how are those things reconciled? Yeah, well, that's the time-honoured question at the moment. But from my point of view, what I wrote about is that a complete stakeholder approach as opposed to an economic approach is probably not going to work. It's, it's too hard. There are too many conflicting objectives. Um, and the ability to make trade-offs is, is really quite difficult. So you want to do something and there's an environment issue. How do you weigh the environment issue against the loss of employment issue? Um, who makes those decisions? Uh, Colin Mayer, who's an Oxford professor, has written most strongly about uh, this subject and particularly about the duty of a board to have a broad remit. Uh, doesn't ever satisfactorily answer the question, how do you make trade-offs between the economic goal and um, he was suggesting, well, you'd have to leave it to the courts. Well, I think that would be the end of the public company. Uh, if every time a director made a judgment that people didn't like, you ended up in court. Uh, so there isn't an easy way to make the trade-off. And uh, I'm not sure that the, you ever will get it right. But I think what's more important, rather than say it's all about shareholders or it's all about stakeholders, is to say companies ought to exist for long periods of time, and that's particularly public companies, 
because the shareholder like that structure allows the renewal of your investment. Yeah, sure. So if you take a long-term view and you think about the implications for stakeholders as something that may either make the decision a lot better or make the decision a lot worse, Mm. then I think you can do a bit of both. Okay. And I think you need to do a bit of both. Yeah. Well, it, well, in that sort of setup, I, you think about them as being nested. So if the company is serving these stakeholders, it's actually serving the shareholders. Yes. Right? It's looking after its customers, it's looking after its workers and such like, and that that's quote-unquote good business. I mean, if that were all there were to it, then why is anybody having any argument about this? It's just that, you know, serving stakeholders is one way you serve, serve shareholders. People seem to be saying more than that. I'm sure Professor Mayer is saying more than that. Well, yes, they're saying that the whole purpose of the corporation needs to be rethought, mm. that uh, it's there as part of the armory of tools you use to build and develop an economy. And it's, got, and it's more than that, to build and develop not just an economy but a society. And if the corporation isn't actively and openly addressing the societal questions people have with its performance, it'll get into trouble. But I think that's true whether you take a stakeholder view or a Mm. shareholder view. Mm. Mm. The sort of elephant in the room that people don't talk about Mm. is um, if a company makes non-economic decisions for social reasons, there's nothing to stop it being bought. Mm. And that's always in the background in a public company. Yep. Uh, That if someone doesn't like the way you're managing it, You find you get bought and you end up generally in private equity. And that's been happening on a much broader scale and is one of the disturbing trends. Uh, Much more has been raised in the last 20 years through private equity than has been raised on stock exchanges. And um, if that's going to go on, it's going to, I think, lead people back to saying it might not be all about economics, but if we don't have an economic lens and understanding, mm. we will lose control of this yeah. capital. Yeah, that, I wanted to come back to that private equity point because that, that's exactly right. But if life gets too tough in the public sphere, uh, it's not that the directors sort of give up on that, it's that they're actually forced out uh, mm. because private equity is saying there's money left on the table here. And the directors might be saying, we understand that because we're not just about maximising profit. And the private equity people can say, yes, but we are, right? And we're buying that company. Good morning, right? And now the thing changes. Now, whether the people want to protest outside the offices of KKR and others for doing that, that's a matter for them, obviously. You won't sort of disappear from having to have a public license. But you do move out of the environment in which people can stand up in shareholders' meetings and accuse you right, of making antisocial decisions. You say, well, that's none of your business. We own the company. We obey the law. That's the end of the matter. And I think that's being it's being handled more gently. Mm. But it's in the back, it's sort of in the background. It's mm. the elephant in the room. You go too far with straining what the public company needs to do economically. You go too far away from that. Mm. And the next thing you just happened to Sydney Airport uh, once a big public company. And in the last few months, it's now a private company. Yeah, yeah. I just want to come back at that from a slightly different angle, Fred. You and I have both been involved in advising governments about how to change laws or set up laws that relate to corporate activity. Mm. And I'd have to say with you standing right there that I think you were more successful than I was getting a bunch of things changed, but be that as it may. Um, People used to look to government to deal with the bigger issues and the trade-offs you mentioned before. You say, well, how do you trade off environmental welfare against the dollar? Right? <laughs> and uh, I think I'm right in saying maybe it's a little simplistic, but the, the, the people used to look to the government to do that. I say, okay, well, you are the elected government, uh, one person, one vote, not one dollar, one vote. And in those circumstances, we look to you now, minister, the parliament and so forth, to make that decision. And when the decision is made, the law has changed, and now the profit-maximising company may find itself on the wrong side of the law doing certain things, right? In which case, bang, it has to change. 
But the pressure to bring about those sorts of changes was directed towards the legislature, towards the parliament, where in principle, it's one person, one vote, one adult, one vote, not one dollar, one vote. And yet we've switched now to a situation where people look to the company, the public company, to make these sorts of trade-offs, when, as you say, it's, it's not universal suffrage in that environment. Yeah, and it's, it's a hard thing for a public company to do. Mm. Yeah, sorry, can't actually change the law. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the arguments that's often made is, if you were worried about the environment, would you prefer that that was going to be addressed by non-binding and generally very general undertakings from a company, mm. or would you prefer that to be addressed by changes in the law that set up an effective carbon, carbon trading mm. uh, scheme and look more broadly at the whole incentives people have in an economy? Mm. And I think the the argument, mm. that I, I, I agreed with that in my own mind, was I think we're better off if we've got a social problem we deal with it as a social problem. Mm. If we have an economic problem, we deal with it as an Separate economic problem. Yeah, that was... And we we don't expect companies to do things that they're not ever really bound to do and may not do all that well. And, okay. well, well, uh, well, we'll move on, but, but one last piece. What has changed that, Fred? Why do people break the public company with this responsibility and move away from freighting the government with its, or the legislature, with its responsibility in that area? I think part of it is because they can. The whole annual general meeting mm. charade, mm. Um, there are pressures that people can bring to bear on public companies. And we are in a much more, I think, I, would, I won't say litigious, but we're in an environment where... Well, everybody has a say, and yeah. it's quite inter easy to put together some sort of group and make a lot of noise. Mm. And I think the ability to make noise is different now. Oh, social media. 20 years ago, yeah. you might try to make the noise, but no one was listening. <laughs> now, people may not be listening, but they enjoy the theatre of a board being berated. Take into account. Mm. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Slight variation on this is this question then of, of purpose, uh, people saying, for example, well, this might be a for-profit company, but in order to attract the talent that you need to make this company profitable or work, you're going to have to address this question of purpose because that's what your employees, the better employees anyway, are looking for, right? So again, are these things nested or is it asking the public company to do too much to try to fulfil people's sense of purpose and meaning, as well as providing a job. Can those things just go together? I, I think they can go together. Um, I think the notion of purpose is one of the positive things that's come out of a broader agenda. Mm. Um, and there's quite a lot of cases. I think I, I used the case of um, IKEA, mm. and the little building blocks, where a company defines a better purpose. Um, the Lego company, it wasn't IKEA, it was Lego. Yeah. The, the Lego company had a purpose of being in the games and toys business. Yeah. And it was struggling, and particularly struggling in electro electronic toys against the Japanese, who were pretty good at making all of these toys that destroy boys' lives. Um, and uh, they had a, a new CEO and they thought about what's their purpose. Mm. And it's to really inspire and equip the builders of tomorrow. Mm. And if you think about Lego blocks and what kids do with it, the ability to become a builder and to love building and constructing is what the company's doing. Mm. And when they made that their purpose, they were able to be much clearer about what they were trying to do, what they would promote, yeah. what R&D they wanted to do, yeah. how they would get into schools. And uh, it took 10 years for the complete transformation, but it's a great case study of what the power of a meaningful purpose. Yeah, in creating and, value. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, might, I, I thought Lego was not a public company, isn't that? 
held by a family? Or... It is held by a family, but I think there, there was some public financing. Okay, okay, all right. So, But nevertheless, whether it's public or private, in that instance, you're making the point that the purpose-driven nature of what yes. they were doing improved their profitability. Yeah. So, so are there examples where you think that there is another tension built in there or are you really comfortable with the idea of purpose-driven corporate life? No, I'm personally comfortable with the notion of purchase purpose mm. because it's, it's too easy to just do the PR thing mm. and a purpose that is deeply embedded in what that company is all about, that sort of purpose, I think, does inspire people. So will there be a breakdown in the so-called distinction between for-profit and for-purpose? Companies that are for-profit will be for-purpose because they're nested, and those that aren't for-profit? Those that aren't profitable. Sorry, I just... Okay, well, it just we, we've always dealt with this trade-off or, or oh, distinction yeah. between the two. Yeah. And, and I gather you know, that there's an illusion now of those two. Yes, I, I think they are coming together. They won't ever wholly come together because sort of in the background, companies have to perform and it's not easy to perform because you have competitors Yeah, and you think you own this particular bit of a market but you wake up thinking, seeing someone else is going for it and in terms of our backgrounds and competition, we think that's a great thing. Yeah, But it doesn't mean that because you have a purpose, you'll succeed. I think if you have a good purpose, you have a better chance. If you have a meaningless purpose, you don't have much mm -hmm. of a chance. Yeah, and people leave you anyway. Okay, let's let's switch gear. You, you talk quite a bit in the book about uh, the founder as executive yes. chair. And this is something which has always not just been sort of foreign to the Australian experience, it's actually not allowed right, in some respects that the owner or founder of a company can end up being... The executive chairman on the board. You need an independent chair. Um, you comment in the book that that's not necessarily a, a, a good rule. And there are lots of examples one can point to in the United States where the founders of these extraordinary companies have had, you know, major roles in their development, chairing boards when they go public and such like, and that the shareholders actually want them there. If they go, then there's value destroyed because the American shareholder at least recognises they want that person to have skin in the game. So, so tell us about your views on that and why you think Australian practice might be out of, out of step here. The question of the founder is, I think, a broader question, in fact, of what the company is going to be able to, how the company should run itself mm. and what good governance means. If you go back to Cadbury, and Bear with me for a minute. Yeah, if you, if you go back to Cadbury, he had four components of what is good governance. The first is a preponderance of independent directors. Nobody, nobody argues with that uh, as a good idea, but it's it's gone too far. And uh, so then you go, and it's, it's gone too far, and people are recognising that just having lots of independence won't do the work that governance is supposed to do mm. because you also need people with deep knowledge and people with deep knowledge and able to help a company make good decisions, those people are not generally tolerant of the tick-the-boxes compliance. So you, his notion of independence is a little bit out of date and not complete. Mm -hmm. Then he comes to the founder and he says, you've got to have this independent founder. Um, why? Um, you, if you look at founder firms and you just referred to it, there's plenty of evidence that they provide better returns to shareholders than firms where there is no founder and there is a, uh, a non-executive chair. And some of the work I repeated in there from the New York Stock Exchange, actually in their research said it makes no difference whether the founder is chair or chair not, or not. Mm -hmm. and on balance, it probably gets you a better earnings result if the founder is chair, yeah. mm -hmm. because the founder has an enormous stake in the business. So, so why did Cadbury argue against that? Well, I, I think for a reason of 
are of purity. Mm. That if you've got a founder who is exec executive, then having all those non-executives on the board won't matter because the founder will really drive it. Okay. Whichever way the founder and wants. Or her way, whichever. And the concern is the founder will be bad. But as you're saying, the evidence is that the founder is, is good. Mm. And it also is just unrealistic to think. I mean, I spent many years as a director of Westfield. To think of Westfield not led by Frank Lowy is unimaginable. Uh, there's a, a quote I include in the book which says, even with a round table, somebody always seems to be sitting at the head. <laughs> yes. So, you know, leadership is a fact. <clears throat> and that's the sort of second concern I've had with Cadbury. First concern is he drives independence as if it's the only issue. And that may have been true 30 years ago. Mm. And he ignores the reality of founders. And as we get into this high-tech world, we're getting more and more of them. People putting their companies together and new billionaires, and so uh, that is something that should be recognised. Um, his third precept was information. Mm. The board is only as good as the information it gets, and I think that's true. But what's happened is there's been an explosion of information, and people in the discussions we had leading up to the book. Mm. The most common complaint was, I just can't handle the volume of reading. Mm. And uh, I terrified that one day in three years' time, a, a barrister will ask me in a court, yeah. when you approved that particular point, yeah. what were you thinking? Yeah. And that's not a comfortable position. So uh, that, that's your, your third thing, information. And the fourth is supporting processes, mm. having audit committees and REM committees and attendances and that. And that makes some sense. But if you look at those requirements of good governance then, they're all either disproved now or have changed due to circumstance. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why I think it is, it, coming back to your first question, mm -hmm. it is timely to look at those things now. And it is, I think, sensible to be prepared to change what, you know, was at the time a brilliant mm. outline of a scheme that was better than the rotting that was going on. Yeah. So I, I take my hat off to Cadbury, but the concern with well, one of the things that's wrong with boards is they're still too stuck in the past. Yeah. Not because of their doing, but as much because the stock exchange. Yeah. Won't change its rules. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to come to that. But is it really beneath this? You've got the ASX so-called guidelines in your sites. But yes. they, they have enshrined or ossified these rules and not kept up with progress, and are therefore not serving the public companies who are being traded on the exchange. Is that? Yes. That, mm. In a one-word answer. Yeah, 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 sure. And how are they responding? Because the ASX itself is a public company. Um, I'm going to talk further with the ASX in, in the next couple of weeks, so mm. sort of hold that. Okay. But it seems to me that you can actually do a lot with the current ASX listing rules mm. if you're prepared to push boundaries. Okay. For example, um, if you say, I'm prepared to have a majority of independence, but it could be an ind a majority of one, and with some of those other positions, I'm going to use either consultants, mm. past employees, founder. And that's not against the listing rule. It's mm. just in the spirit of a different rule. Yeah. And I, I think there's, there's scope to do that. But I think it would be a very healthy thing for the ASX to fundamentally review the listing rules mm. and mm. where it sees them as a break on contemporary good performance, mm. be prepared to change, change the rules. Mm. That makes sense. Uh, let's pursue that a little more. The, the, the skills matrix, you also take aim at that, right? Uh, this notion that the board needs to consist of this spread of, of directors with a spread of skills that nicely fill the matrix. And, and I, I look at my chairman. <laughs> We're both on the REM and NOMS committee here at the school, which is a public company. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, it is... Um, 
uh, public company limited by guarantee, not by shares. But nevertheless, it's a public company. And therefore, the directors have duties. And Ross, our chairman, and myself as chief executive managing director, we need to fill this skills matrix. So tell us a little bit about that. I mean, in particular, how does that relate to, in your view, board performance? And is it some sort of guarantor of, of the information, perhaps, and or independence that you think are required for good performance? Yeah, it, the skills matrix is one of my favourite examples. Um, if you look at 2003, there's no word of a skills matrix in the ASX listing rules. So then the next review, three years later, 2006, silence, nothing about a skills matrix. Then I think around 2010, 2011, there's a statement, companies should have a skills matrix. Didn't say why, didn't say you know, to what purpose. It just seems like it would be helpful, it would be helpful to investors. So, um, I encourage any of you to do this. It doesn't take very long. You just go onto Google, put in skills matrix and a company name, and they have these skills matrices. Having read them, I can see nothing that would cause me either to buy a share, sell a share, uh, or do anything with that company. There are a series of very general statements um, that are set out in a matrix because there's a matrix. They, the way you put it was absolutely what what they look for. That we'll have a little bit of that. We need a bit of engineering. Yeah, IT's no. coming up. We better have an IT it's, person on the board right. or um, digital. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> life isn't like that. Um, it, if the purpose of the listing rule is to help the company better inform investors then skills matrix isn't going to do it. So I, I, I use it as my example of how this sort of creeping regulation sort of comes along and you wake up one day and you've got a company secretary department with, you know, one of the onerous jobs each year is coming up with the skills matrix. Mm. Indeed. But for all the skill boxes that get ticked, I read you as saying, amongst other things, that the really, a really valuable trait in a company director, at least one or two of them, is what you describe in the book as a nose for trouble. Yeah. Right? A nose for trouble. And, and but again, you know, to your point, the skills matrix uh, may or may not help to cultivate the nose for trouble. But let's talk about that for a bit, Fred. What, what do you mean by a nose for trouble? And, and how, if somebody has, how, can you cultivate that? Or what, what do you look for? And how do you encourage a person, if they've got the nose for trouble, to actually speak up and say, excuse me, right? But I smell trouble here. Yeah. I, I think it, it's not an idea we made up. It came out of the interviews mm. with some of the more experienced and well-known directors. And... They say after a while in this role where you oversee, you get a sense of am I being told the whole story or are things missing? Some of the things that sort of trigger the nose for trouble, one of them is things are going too well. Um, why are things going that well? We aren't that strong and our competitor seems to be doing good things. Why, why are we struggling? So that, that's an example. Uh, there are a number of other examples that knows the trouble. One is this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then at the last minute, I don't think that's such a good idea anymore. Oh. So shifts, changes in the strategy. You mean coming up from management. Yes, coming up yeah. from management. Um, and I think the nose for trouble is something that develops uh, some CEOs, I mean, in my experience working with them, are just fantastic at sensing whether people are going to deliver or whether they're just posing in an interview. And that's to be part of the nose for trouble. 
this person's genuinely the strong performer, this person genuinely will deliver. I sense that, and he's what I'm seeing. Mm. And, I mean, it comes back to a board of directors is a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, it's generally, what, 8, 10, 12 people. Mm. Um, most have, other than the chairman, primary interests that are um, more important to them than coming once every few months to a board. Um, they know each other, probably in Australia more, because we have a, yeah, a, small, pool. a, a small pool, but they know each other relatively rarely, and um, they're supposed to come back with the life and death decisions on the success of this enterprise. And I think recognising that their success in doing that is a result of, to some degree, instinct, experience, is just a reality. And it's where, to me, come back to skills matrix. Um, nothing in a skills matrix suggests some of the directors are having some trouble with the direction we're following and they're raising questions. So I thought a nose for trouble, you might be able to put it more nicely, but a nose that things aren't as they seem yeah. is an important characteristic. Mm -hmm. And you need directors. Not everybody's going to be doing that in the same way. Mm -hmm. But I think a board is strengthened by having a couple of these dissenters and sniffers of the environment yep. Yep. on the board. Yep. And just the, the second leg of that, could, how can you encourage directors who might think there's trouble at mill to actually speak up about that, particularly if that's a view that's not held by others? So they might trot something out and discover that their fellow directors don't accept that, or certainly management doesn't accept that. And so you're swimming against the stream here. Yeah. Two, two things. One is leadership, and one is critical mass. Um, I think the chairman's role is under-recognised in terms of its importance, and that's one of the things we devote our final chapter to, leadership of the board. And the, the other idea I've heard is it's very lonely if you're the only person who has this concern. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we've, I've seen chairman do is to say, why don't we have a debate about this? And you, Ian, and a new friend seem to be having concerns. Mm -hmm. so you can be the team four, and here's a couple of other directors who aren't worried about that, and they'll be the team against. And let's debate it. And debate it in, this, in the sense of let's find out who's right yeah. or who's more likely to be right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's those sorts of processes need to be thought about because one of the things that... I, directors have said to me, is it is lonely being the only the only dissenting voice. And what often happens there, and this is another sort of trigger of the nose, is people leave the board. Yeah, quietly I resign. Think, I think that's a really bad outcome. I think if you're on a board and you're concerned enough not to want to stay there, you really have a duty to sit to that board and to your colleagues to say, I'm leaving because I have concerns about these things. I may be wrong but I think others need to bring them to the ground. And that's something that you think should be shared with all directors, not just the chair? Sorry? Uh, that, that when you find yourself in that situation, that you'd make that clear to all of your fellow directors, not just the chair. Yeah, I would start with the chairman. Right. I'd say to the chairman, how do, we, how do you think we should handle this? Right, right. And if I you like, then conclude that the answer is you need to go... We need to... Take this one head on. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll, we need your help in doing that. We don't need you to leave the board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there are companies where bad things are happening. Yeah. And people leave the board and don't want to enmesh themselves in litigation. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, that's life. You've got to look after number one from sure. time to time. Sure, sure. So there'd be people here, certainly amongst our, our student body, Fred, who, who would aspire to be directors of public companies. What sort of counsel would you give based on your experience and knowledge to somebody who's thinking, you know, it'd be terrific to have a portfolio of these 
company directorships, maybe one or two big public companies if I could manage that. Uh, what advice would you give to such a person? Uh, with a smile, I would say, careful what you wish for. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, if someone, th there is a trend we're seeing today where people with professional qualifications are leaving their professions yeah. and becoming professional directors. Yeah, portfolio professionals. I think that's a really dangerous you think development. It's dangerous. Okay, tell us and about that. The, the reason is because you've now closed off your source of income, you're a partner in an accounting firm, you've closed that off, and you're now reliant on two or three boards paying some hundreds of thousands. There's an issue that you feel strongly about and that your colleagues don't share. And you put your heels in and say, no, I think we really need to look at this. I don't think this is in mm. our interest. Mm. The next thing you find is you're a troublemaker. No. And you don't get the next board invitation. So you're not really an independent director. You're beholden to the company for your living. And uh, I think that's a problem. Even if you've got a portfolio of them. Because, as you say, if the, you might have three or four, right? Yes. So you're not beholden to anyone in particular, but your point being that if you decide to dig in, then you get a name for yourself, and, and so it ends up being three and then maybe two, right? And before you know where you are, you're no longer exercising your independence. Is that the line of argument? Yes, I think that's, that's mm. the concern mm. um, that we just don't recognise what independence requires. And it comes right back to Cambry. Right. You know, he thought independence is not having worked for the company, either in an employment yeah. capacity or a consulting capacity. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's changed now with the notion of a professional director. It's also changed because directors' fees are much better than they were. Sure. Um, I think you'd see the inflation in directors' fees is yeah. quite significant. Yeah. Well, directors here at the school have now paid 50, 100 times what they've been paid in the past. Isn't that right, Ross? Mm. And worse. It. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to the audience and to those online shortly for questions. So be thinking about your own question. And if you're online, you can put your question in the chat and then one of my colleagues will call the question out when we come to that. So if you're online, uh, you're not excluded. And, of course, in the room, I'll come to you shortly. So think about your question. Fred, before we go to that, I'd just like to ask you, and you've written the book, and the title is What's Wrong with Boards? No question mark. You're telling us what you think is wrong with boards. You mentioned earlier on um, this creeping regulation that, in your view, including the skills matrix and aspects of the ASX listing rules and the others around the world, uh, have hidebound, to some extent, the public company. Um, What's at the top of your list, Fred, that's wrong with boards? One of the things that I would put quite high on the list is this notion of best practice. Mm -hmm. We've kind of made a fetish of best practice. And I mean, come back to the skills matrix, it was asserted that that's best practice. Mm -hmm. We never prove it. No. One of the, the just bear with me, I won't read too much. No, go ahead. But one of my favourite discoveries in uh, I won't read it because I don't... Can you find it straight up? Here we go. Right. Where does the phrase, phrase best practice originate? This is from a professor of education. Oh. He said, I checked around the blogosphere. Its origin seems to be in the business sector with management consultants and corporate gurus. Oh, dear. It's become a buzzword across government, education, and medical organization. In becoming popular, it's drifted away from its original meaning. Mm. And I think there's no area where I see the best practice used or misused mm. Uh, there's no area more than governance. Okay. Um, Interesting. Because you, you assert this 
And then you're sort of on the defensive. That's be- How do you know it's best practice? Mm. Well, everybody knows that that's best practice. Mm. Mm. So one of the things that I think we're a long way from your question about becoming directors. Yeah. But one of the things that I think is wrong with boards, one of them is that it's too hard to get flexibility out of the rules, and that's making it harder for boards. Right. And the second is when we come to points of view that we want to incorporate it into the listing rules, we revert to best practice, which really means what I think it is. Yeah, yeah. But and I'd like to see. I, I mean, to get governance back on a more evidence-based approach is, I think, one of the big opportunities looking forward. Hmm. Okay. Good place to pause. Well, let's go to questions now from the floor. Can I ask you, before you answer, ask your question, let us know who you are uh, and where you're from, and then you can ask your question. So let's go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Minna Pitley Angus from Penley and Eston Grammar School. Um, Fred, can you just um, provide some advice on dealing with conflicts and, more importantly, the perception of conflicts on boards? The perception of conflicts. Yeah. I mean, I, there are conflicts and conflicts. And I'll go back to um, when I, Westfield for a minute, because I, Westfield seems to or thrive on conflict. Mm-hmm. And I was new to that board, and there was a proposal in the board to make an investment in some offshore facilities. And I, I thought, I'm the new person, but I, this doesn't make a lot of sense um, in terms of the stretch it would have put the organization under. And I sort of, in a, I won't say in a quavering voice, but I was, ner- I was nervous because, you know, what do I know? And here's Frank Lowy, who's created billions. And I said, Frank, I, I'm not sure that makes sense, but I'm reluctant to raise it. He said, you should never be reluctant to raise it. I remember he took my arm. Yeah. He said, you're here because you're going to raise it. Tell me what bothers you. And so we, we had a conflict. But it was in the, he, in the end, how did we resolve the conflict? He said, it was an Asian investment. He said, get on the plane, go up there, talk to everybody, and then come back and tell the board what you learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did that with one of the other directors. And it was a great investment not to make. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were right. So I was right. But that's not. But the, no, no. The, the, the point, point is, is that, that it changed. It did change the decision. Yes, it, right. it changed. It changed. Well, it, it put the decision in front of them with a lot more data and understanding. Right. So there are other times when you get non-constructive conflict where I just don't think you under where people don't actually give the reasons in a way that you can test it. Ah, yeah. um, and that couldn't be a nose for trouble. You know, I'm not really sure, but I smell trouble here. It could be. Mm-hmm. People were sort of pro yeah. you, and at the end of the day, if you can't put your finger on it, presumably yeah. you have to withdraw it. Right? But the, the quality of board discussion, to me, is the central process yeah. by which you make better decisions. Yes, yeah. yeah, the cut and trust. And then I said, we, we've moved this best practice is the exact opposite of an informed discussion. Mm. Okay. Dean. Thanks, Mon. Thank you, Fred. Dean Island from Maritana. Um, Fred, I enjoyed your comment about the economics and social balance intention on our boards, but I wondered if you could make a comment about the views and the power of the proxies on boards, uh, particularly how should our system hold them accountable and and lastly, when should or what sort of issues should a board ignore them on? Should a board ignore, ignore them on? <laughs> it's a great question, and I'm I have no way of doing it justice. Um, there are there are times when you are you either ignore something and you take the risk 
that it'll blow up because if I don't ignore it, I think it'll be worse. So I'm not sure I know what, what I'm fully talking about here. Mm. But I think when you get a process like the proxy process being used in a particular way, you have to go back and ask yourself, is that what it was really here for? If it wasn't here for that, I think there's a process point that you probably want to look at. But I think it's a great question, and I really don't have a, mm. a, a crisp answer. Mm. I think it's something you work your way through. Right. Wow. So issue by issue. Then. Yes. Mm. Um, let's see if there's a question on the... Yes, there is on the chat. Thank you, Amelia. So we've got something from Catherine Walter. She said, it may be useful to analyze who we mean by stakeholders, employees, customers, community, et cetera. This may determine the time frame too of the impact of the company's activities. Um, is, there, is there something you want to comment on that, yeah. Fred? Um, there's a number of different articulations of the stakeholder. Um, and that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I think it's got to be take, looked at with quite a lot of care. Yeah. Um, I think when this started, it was sort of customers, employees, then broadened to the community, uh, it broadened to the environment. Mm. Uh, because I think what happens is things get added on, but they don't fall off. And... Uh, All you can do is, you know, deal with it issue by issue. Mm. Um, the uh, expression that's used, I think Drucker uses it, that you, you're trying, when you've got all these different requirements, you're trying to get some sort of reasonable balance. Yeah. But he says the true north, true north is the customer. Mm. And so you can agree with that or disagree with that, but it, it, it makes you think about what 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 am I really doing? Who are we really doing this for? What's the benefit to them of us doing this? And why is that also in the interests of the entity? Mm, that's right. And and of course that may well not be in the interests of the broader community. That that's the point. That's where the law yes. comes in to constrain the sorts of deals that companies can do serving their customers that are actually antisocial or yeah. against the interests of the environment or future generations. I mean, one of the bad things with this last sort of financial crisis was that people, this wasn't firms going under, this was firms dudding customers. Be for no service. Oh, you're talking about Hayden. Yeah, yeah sure. In, in sure. Hayden. Yeah. If you think about financial crisis, they generally end up with lots of big companies going under. Yeah, that's right. Nobody went under here. In fact, people were making money by not providing the service to the customer mm. or by not acting always in the customer's interests. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's something that's quite different now. Mm. And it's something that I think Hain triggered the addressing of. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, there was a question I think in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Catherine Nolan, Hall and Wilcox. I'm not exactly sure I'm going to frame this question, but um, I was really interested at very, right at the beginning, you were talking about the increase in the volume of information that is available and the skills that directors need. And I was thinking about last night's 7.30 report with mm -hmm. uh, Frances Howden, I think her name is the whistleblower yeah, yeah, from, from Facebook. Facebook. And... I think of myself as a relatively intelligent person who's thought about social media, et cetera, but the kind of connections she was making about the damage that was being done by that company or her allegations, particularly around decisions that they made to grow their company by providing services essentially data free in developing countries, but they're not supporting language. So two what I would see is totally unrelated decisions. And I think an intelligent board member might not necessarily see them as even being board decisions. They're kind of operational 
on the ground decisions messed up with a founder who has since floating at least basically told the world, I don't even want to be a public company. I'm doing this because the law tells me I have to. And if I'm going to reward my employees with ownership, I have to take the company public under the particular rules at the time. Like I said, this is not a well-formed question. There's a lot of different issues that are going there. Um, is this an opportunity for me for the first time to stand back and actually feel sorry for directors thinking how hard this is? I think uh, Ian asked me why, why, why the book got, got... One of the reasons for dealing with this subject at this time is that I think it's become really harder and harder to be a director. Mm. And uh, the purpose of the book wasn't to say, well, there's an easy, best way. No. It was rather to say... This is hard, it's getting harder, and probably going back to basics and just rethinking why do we do this? Mm. Uh, why, why are some of the, what we call more of the same remedies not working, and what might work? But uh, it's, it's an interesting question. It, it is a difficult question to form. Um, yeah. But I think my short answer is it's, it's getting harder. Um, there's a great skill in writing short papers. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but I, that's right. I remember my consulting days um, when I was in the US and we were doing some work for General Electric and Jack Welch was a legendary CEO. Yeah. The front page of any document you gave him had to be a complete statement of the issue. Yeah, yeah. You get one page. If you haven't got me at the end of that page, Forget it. Forget yeah. it. It's yeah. gone. Like Churchill was the same. So it, it is sometimes I think skills like that might be coming back. Yeah. Because we can't, mm -hmm. we just can't deal with the volume of paper. Yeah. It's a nice speech. It'll be a long speech. I didn't have time to write a short. Yes. <laughs> that was Twain. Ross Barker. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in uh, Ross Barkey, the chairman of the business school. Could I just follow up Dean's question about the proxy advisors? Because I had a, uh, my, uh, when I was in full time employment, I was uh, the managing director of Australian Foundation Investment Company, and we used to talk to the proxy advisors a lot, a lot as an investor. But the interesting thing to me, what I observed was, with the aggregation of shareholding ownership into the superannuation funds and large investors, many of them didn't have time to do the work. So they just relied on the proxy advisors. There's three or four of them. And I can tell you every word they say is it's best practice to do this and it's best practice to do that. Mm -hmm. And they carry weight with the super funds and they carry weight at the AGMs. And so the boards are then constrained by the opinions of the proxy advisors to a very, very large degree. And the issue is that if a board wants to go down a different path, they have to fight the proxy advisors. And I mean fight. They have to fight them. And this is actually quite a significant issue. It's a very significant issue. Great. Yeah, no, thanks. Thank you. That's, that's something I, I think I'll look at as I don't, as I don't just stop with the book. Mm, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, is there one on the line, Amelia, another one? Yeah. Okay, we'll just take that and I'll come back. Hi, oh, we've got one from Kate Rawlings. Uh, the types of uh, risks boards need to be across is growing, uh, for example, cyber risk. How do boards develop their understanding of new and emerging threats? not a glib answer, but they need to spend time on it. Um, one of the concerns that came out in talking to people about putting this book together was that we tend to look at, I won't say trivial risks, but sort of technical risks that mm. we can sort of see. And we don't look at risks that are much more important and much more threatening. To the business. Uh, to the business. Mm. And the example is COVID. Oh. The 
COVID didn't appear on many risk registers. I, I think the whole risk area is, is hard because it's easy to say, well, if you're an investor in a public company, you take risk. And that might mean, or it does mean, there are times when you lose money. Um, and the risk process, the bit that I'm uncomfortable with is there's a sort of belief that if you get your risk right, you won't lose money. If you get your risk analysis right, and you do your job as a risk committee, you won't lose money. Um, and I, I think that's dangerous because if you're going to take risk, then almost by definition, yeah. there'll be times when you lose money. So, um, I mean, I think of the committees, we didn't talk about those, but I, I mean, I think there's improvements underway in order. It's not perfect, but I think people understand some of its weaknesses. Um, I think REM has awful problems with the three strikes rule. Um, I, um, but I've always found risk the hardest mm. to come to terms with. Mm. Uh, because this is, if we think of it, well, we had an inexperienced risk person on the university board when I was vice chancellor. And if you know the University of New South Wales, it is in the flight path. Um, of the East West Runway, yeah. yeah. And one person with a very, I, I think, really meant it said, What's our risk uh, approach going to be if a plane on a flight path came in too low and hit the library tower? And I said, We're not adding a lot of value here. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. An example of, I mean, you, it, it's never happened. It's unlikely it ever to happen. Yeah. And if it did happen, there's no provision you could make as a university yep. that would cover you against that kind of no. uh, horror. Um, so this shouldn't be anywhere near a risk committee. What we think, we've got to think much more about it. Yeah. Where are your real risks? Just press the button there, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good question. Tim. Tim Hammond, non executive director. Fred, first, I want to say that the views you've expressed are incredibly refreshing. Uh, a lot of the topics you've touched upon are, uh, have been, you know, hanging around for a long time and people need to take a fresh look at them and I think this, this will prompt good debate. Could I put a more positive spin on some of the discussion? And that is really just a comment that, yes, it is getting hard for directors, but as a director, sitting on boards with people who've got high levels of competence, many of them have good noses for trouble, uh, they've got lots of experience, and when you bring that combination together, and there'll be other elements of that, you don't walk into a boardroom, boardroom fear, fearful. You walk into the boardroom saying, I'm amongst a group of people with a lot of skills, a lot of experience. So I guess the, the point I'm making is, for those contemplating it, it doesn't have to be all fear. And I think it becomes critical that you form a judgment about the people who mm -hmm. also sit on the board. Because if you get that mix right, forget the skills matrix, I agree with you totally, it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. But if you get the mix of people in that boardroom right, you are actually going to be able to add value and not sit there in fear all the time. Yeah. Thank you. No, fair comment. Uh, did you want to respond, Fred? Well, I, I I, I agree with that, and it's mix determined as much by personality, style, way of handling conflict as it is by a particular qualification. Yeah, good. Ma'am? Hi, uh, Dr. Mailing Doe from MDMD. Accepting your uh, comment about financial independence being the ideal precondition for independence, how do you reconcile that with the I guess, environment in which, say, women can't even get equal pay. I'm sorry, I couldn't, you, I, 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 I couldn't hear some of that. Okay. I think you, you're driving at the fact that... that uh, Let's accept that having economic independence is yeah. an ideal precondition 
to be an effective mm-hmm. director. Right. How does that balance or bode with our desire for diversity and inclusion in an environment where the reality is women can't even get equal pay? Yeah, I, I think they, they, they are related. And nobody has defined independence that way yet because of the consequences. Um, so there's still sort of work to be done. Um, and but you're absolutely right. If, if if you want to have diversity, and that includes diversity from people who aren't independently wealthy, then you've got to have some way of dealing with independence by being dependent on directors. There's, there's more. There's more to independence. I think it's a good sort of way to wrap up. We started with Cadbury on a very notion, on a very narrow notion of independence. We've broadened that and there's more dollars involved, but we haven't yet got our thinking in line. What does that really mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's one here and the one online. We'll take this one first and then we'll go online. Is that okay? Oh, sorry, one. Well. <laughs> All right, okay. Next time I'll do as I'm told. Um, just uh, tying a couple of points and, and, and a question really about um, how to how to create the conversations we need on these boards. Um, just back to the question about Facebook, um, my reaction when I was watching that woman, and I don't know how many saw that, was, wow, she should be on his board. I mean, the first thing I thought was, this is someone who understands mental health, is is really understanding what these algorithms are doing to the kids of today. I mean, the figures of 38% of all kids between 25 and, no, 13 and 25 are dying of suicide. 38%, that's phenomenal. And that a lot of it is, is generated by this. It comes to me to this point of risk, and, and the bigger question is around how do we create boards that can have fearless conversations? We have a, a world right now where you know there are 10 major interconnected risks on the planet, whether it's water or climate change or loss of biodiversity or plastics or what you know endocrine disruptors. And we have we don't have fearless conversations on boards. We need to we need to be able to address these issues, and diversity I think is an essential part of that. So my question to you is. How do we um, how do we invite the, the kind of uh, not a not a, a, um, a disagreement on boards that's destructive, but the the robust conversations that we need to have when disagreements are necessary to address big global risks or community risks or whatever the the things are. And I think risk there's there's a flip side of risk, and that's opportunity. Is if a company really does understand you know, what, what its serious risks are, it can actually better serve its shareholders by, by understanding that. So I guess I'm looking at that Facebook question, thinking about the diversity question and thinking about your really interesting points on, on Lowy. And I was thinking, <laughs> my other thought was maybe Lowy needs to be counseling or, or mentoring um, Zuckerberg. Um, but but how, how, do you have any thoughts on sort of how to help boards? Um, what, what is it? And is it just leadership that can help boards have these courageous conversations about the difficult issues, and some of them are high risk. It's, we're not in a low risk world. A lot of these companies are, are are in a situation where they are either providing real value or or real detriment to to civilization as we know it. So, how do we have those difficult conversations? And I love the way Loey responded to you. I was thinking that's exactly the right answer. You know, take someone by the arm and say, "Help me figure this out," mm-hmm. and go and really understand it deeply. Um, and I wanted just to have as a last reflection from you, I guess, just what your thoughts are on how to create that kind of environment and what kind of, of diversity or, or inviting of your critics uh, do you need to have courage to do to, in, to enable those conversations to be robust and seriously addressing society's issues and the board's issues? Thank you. A, a quick and inadequate answer is it's one word, leadership. We um, interviewed quite a lot of people putting this together and a fairly common sort of aside questions by what what do you think is the most important issue and it came down it was the most important issue is the leadership how do we select a chair there's it's not a process that will surface a lot of frank lowe's um 
what do we expect of the chair? Uh, what happens if the chair, if the board isn't performing? How, how do we deal with the non-performing chair? Um, but there was there's too much sort of history and politics in the selection of a chair. It's my turn. Mm -hmm. And we don't need people whose turn it is. Mm -hmm. We need people, I, I like the word, fearless conversational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Let's have the last one online. So this is from Ron Ferdinands. He said, Fred, thank you for your insightful thoughts. In my experience, I find boards in private companies rolling their sleeves up more and more in strategy and implementation, much of the consternation of senior management. In your view, is the dividing line between senior management and the board changing? Probably, probably is. Um, particularly when you get concerns about operational risk. Um, remember that came out of some of the inquiries that were triggered by home. Mm. We, need, we need to look at operational and non-financial risk, not just financial risk. And that was IT related. Mm. So I, I think you'll see over time, uh, I agree with you, you'll get closer working relationships mm. um, between the chief operating manager yeah. and the finance and strategy managers. Yeah. Yeah. Fred, I think Tim put his finger up. It's been so refreshing to hear lots of different views. You're a deep thinker and always have been, admired by many, Fred. It's terrific that you've taken the opportunity now to put these thoughts down. Uh, if your wet appetite has been whetted by listening to Professor Helmer, uh, you can get a copy of the book, either on Booktopia or yourself. If you let my colleagues know on the way out and give us an address, then we can get you a copy with a discount. Uh, but you can get it on Booktopia anyway. What's Wrong With Boards by Fred Hilmer. Before I invite my colleague, uh, Karan, to close the meeting, would you join me in thanking Professor Hilmer for the moment? Fred, just echoing Ian's thanks for bringing wealth, wisdom, insight, experience, and sharing it with us here this morning, both in person and online. Clearly demonstrated you've got a nose for trouble in the board <laughs> landscape, and you're not shy to call it out. Uh, and we're all benefited and enriched by that. Thank you, Ian, uh, for stewarding such a stimulating conversation. Lots of food for thought, mm. together with breakfast, of course. And now, if we do something small, great, but thank you again. Maybe we'll have to back in some sort of thinking board. Indeed. We could do what's right with boards. <laughs> a, a thin volume. <laughs>